Uh, ju okay. Broadly speaking, there are two types of gastrointestinal worms. Those that feed on blood, such as the barber's pole, and those that don't. And these are usually re referred to as the scale worms. Barber's pole uses a lance protruding from the top of its head area to lacerate the abomasal wall, causing the release of copious amounts of blood into the fourth stomach. The resultant blood loss from a heavy infestation can lead to a condition known as anemia. By contrast, scale worms feed on detritus and cause gastrointestinal disturbances such as diarrhea, nutritional deficiencies due to malabsorption, and weight loss. Next slide, thanks. The name barber's pole gives a hint that this parasite feeds on blood. The barber's pole is coloured red and white. The scientific name for the barber's pole worm is homonchus, and heme refers to components of blood. So that's your hook for remembering that pharmachar is for barber's pole. Anemia is best seen in a live animal where the blood vessels are close to the surface of the skin and not hidden by pigment. And the ocular membranes of the lower inner eyelid are perfect to do this. Anemia can also be seen in the gums around the teeth. So, so we are using an indirect way of measuring the size of a worm burden that's inside the gut and hidden from view. In other words, we are looking for external signs of an internal infestation. The picture on the right, when the red blood cells are low in number, fluid can leak out of the blood vessels into the surrounding tissues and collect under gravity in areas such as under the jaw. And this condition is referred to in sheep and goats as bottle jaw. However, by the time these visual signs are present, the animal is quite sick. It's important to remember that there are many causes of anemia. So if you see anemia, you will need to rule out other causes such as liver fluke and nutritional deficiencies such as copper and cobalt. Redness, redness of the mucous membranes can also be caused by dust and allergens. Similarly, there are other causes of bottle jaw such as heart failure and tumours. Next slide, thanks. So let's look at the card. The name of the card is derived from the name of its South African developer. So it's Fafa Milan's chart or Pharma Char. Briefly, the card displays a graduation of five colours from red to white, which each color, with each colour indicating a different level of anemia. Basically, the colours are red, pink and white, with variations either side of the pink red, pink and pink, white. The eyelid colour of the goat is then matched up with the colour on the scorecard, with the score being on a scale of 1 to 5, with 1 red being non-anemic and 5 white very anemic. The drench icons are included as prompts. The no drench situation is a tick, the drench gun indicates when to drench, and the skull and crossbones unfortunately at score 5 white says it all. You've left it just a bit too late. Level three is the point at which producers have to decide to decide whether to drench or not. So my recommendation is be cautious when dealing with barber's pole. The experience of our sheep producers in South East Queensland is that a score of three becomes a score five by the next day. So in a peak worm season, if your goats are scores three, four or five, be prepared to drench on the same day. Ideally, you would examine the goats in the race and as you process each one, decide to drench or not to drench before you release them. Time is of the essence with Barber's Pole. Next slide, thanks, Julie. So let's run through how to do the test. The card used in this picture is a slightly older version. Firstly, it's easier if two people do the examination. One to handle the goat and the other to hold the card, confirm the score and then to record it. Goats need to be examined in good natural light so that the true colour can be seen. 
use the thumbs of both hands. With the thumb of the upper hand, gently push the upper eyelid down vertically, while at the same time the lower thumb gently pulls the lower eyelid downward. Next slide, thanks. Look at the colour of the mucous membranes on the lower inner eyelid and compare that colour with the colours on the chart. Note the score. In general, goats don't tend to have a score one because they don't have as many red blood cells or pack cell volume as sheep, as the card was originally developed for sheep. Examine both eyes and err on the side of caution, especially in young goats. If the score is somewhere between a two and three, be conservative and use the score three. Again, if the score for one eye is higher than the other, use the higher or more anemic score. Next slide, thanks. This is about good and bad technique. And most importantly, at least both operators are using cards and not their memory to score. On the left, the technique is being performed correctly. But in the right hand picture, one person is trying to hold both the eyelids open and the card at the same time, with the result that the upper thumb is pulling the upper eyelid up, not down. And it's important to only keep the eye open for a short time, maybe a few seconds, otherwise the blood may rush back into the area and give a false red reading. Next slide, thanks Julie. So this is a mantra you might like to memorize. Cover the eye by rolling the upper eyelid down over the eyeball. Push down on the eyeball. Pull down the lower eyelid and the mucous membranes will pop into view. Score the bed of the mucous membranes, not the inner surface of the lower eyelid. Next slide, thanks. This is about how to read the card and it's put in table form. So the score and its related colour are shown in the two left hand columns and that's easy enough. PCV or packed cell volume is a laboratory test for anemia and by including these readings in this table you can see that the method has been validated against laboratory testing. The need to drench or not is clear cut except when it comes to level 3. This is the grey area that needs some judgement on the part of the owner. The general recommendation is to treat score 3 goats when more than 10% of the herd has scores 4 or 5. So if you have 100 goats, 11 or more will be anemic. However, the recommendation is to also be conservative. So it would be reasonable to treat all score 3 animals during a wet spell. And this particularly applies to young animals, those that are pregnant or lactating, and any animals in poor body condition and not meeting their target weights. Next slide, thanks Julie. This record sheet can be downloaded from a website and I'll give you that address shortly or it can be developed in Excel. If you use Excel, also record e-tag numbers as well as the dates of testing, any treatments given, the totals of goats that fall under each score. And on this record sheet, totals per score are in the right hand columns. So if you use Excel, these total columns can then be graphed to display trends over time. While it is important to know the status of your goats at any time, recording over the seasons will elucidate trends. A shift to the right, for instance, with more goats trending towards anemic is an early warning that pastures could be carrying a high level of parasite contamination and that infection levels in goats are rising. If this is the case, goats should be moved to clean pastures with browse and to increase their plane of nutrition. So trends over seasons can identify those persistently wormy goats that should be culled in order to build a more worm resistant population of goats. Next slide, thanks. Early in the season you might need to be diligent about the rechecking intervals 
particularly if any scores three, four and five are present as these goats are contaminating the pastures. Kids have a small blood volume and succumb to heavy infestations while they still look healthy. So to be on the safe side, check Wheatley from November to March, irrespective of whether the numbers of anemic goats in the herd is greater or less than 10%. If you do drench, it will take 12 to 14 days for the goat to replace the red blood cells lost to the parasites. Immediately after the drench, the anemia should stabilise in terms of the colour with a gradual return to the non-anemic colour, unless of course the drench was uses in which case the goat would deteriorate further. The other possibility is that the diagnosis of anemia due to Barber's pole was incorrect. Next slide, thanks. So the farmer chaff system is ideal for small to, small to medium sized herds. Statistically, if a significant number of animals are checked, this should provide reliable information about the entire herd. But in order to preserve drenches, we need information about individual goats. Next slide, thanks. Parasite research has demonstrated that 20 to 40 percent of goats in a herd can carry the 60 to 80 percent of the worm load. So the wormy tail group of genetically more susceptible goats needs to be culled. Some researchers working on sheep farms in the Gundawindi area of southern Queensland found that by removing 21% of the wormy animals in the mob, the worm egg count of the remaining mob was halved. And this is dramatic and supports the 20-80 rule. 20% 20 of the goats carry 80% of the worm burden. However, if you only have 10 or so goats, you may not see exactly this breakdown. So this table displays the results that are typically seen from lab testing of 10 samples taken randomly for a monitor. Most of the counts are low. But the two, uh, there are two high counts and probably these are from the only two goats in the group that need treatment. Again, the 80-20 rule. So if you plan to check just a few of your goats, how will you know which ones to check? You may just be checking the low counters and missing out on the high counters that really do need to drench, so that, to be drenched. So the more animals you check, the better will be the information. Thanks, Julie. Next slide. Farmer char, if used frequently, can identify the progression of anemia and facilitate treatment of a damaging barber's pole burden before it gets out of hand. Decide which goats to drench and which to cull and exclude from any breeding program. And it makes sense that you build a more worm resistant herd through using farmer char so that the host contribute to controlling its own parasite burden. Barber's pole pushes out huge numbers of eggs each day when conditions are favourable. Up to 10,000 eggs per worm per day and this can quickly destroy even the best devised worm control programs. Next slide, thanks. So just in summary, just a few remembers. Don't forget, remember to examine both eyes. Remember that goats don't usually have a score one because often their number of red blood cells are lower than sheep, which normally score one. You need to examine goats every week during the wet season and be conservative about borderline scores. If in doubt, treat these animals. Also, drench any goats you're unsure about and particularly susceptible goats, the young animals, the does that are pregnant or lactating in high-risk seasons. And remember when you make your diagnosis to rule out other causes of anemia bottle jaw and redness. Next slide, thanks, Julie. So your first port of call if you want some more information is the American Consortium for Small Ruminant Parasite Control. So if you go to your search engine and type in ACSRPC, you'll come up with their web page. 
So click on the Topics um, tab, then click on Pharmachar, and then click on Information. And I strongly recommend that you read this open letter to sheep and goat producers that's been written by Dr Ray Kaplan. And many of you may have seen Ray when he was out here in um, 2012 talking to producers, goat and sheep producers at Stanthorpe. And so from this site you can get uh, other links to other research uh, organisations such as Langston University and the Maryland Extension Program. And Julie, perhaps this open letter, we might be able to put a link to that on the MLA site because it's very interesting uh, and it's directed to on-farm use of this um, technique. So lastly, next slide, thanks. So if you want a card, you'll probably have to ask your veterinarian for a hands-on training course. and. The information about that to, to purchase the card um, can be found with these contact details below. So Julie, I think probably at this stage, if there are any questions, we might actually speak to them. Okay, thanks very much, Maxine. So we've got a couple of questions that have come through. I'll just, um, I'll just pull those out. Uh, so one of the questions is, is there any sort of tips if, if you are sort of a sole operator, you've just got yourself they're trying to test the goats so only one person is um, obviously that's certainly not what what you're recommending but is there any sort of um, I guess way they might be able to just do the test with the with the one person potentially um, well I guess if you go on the internet you can search and there are pictures of of single operators with the card between their second and third finger of their their right hand so as they use that hand to push down the upper eyelid they're also holding that card and they can see that colour but I, probably the most important thing to do is that you're not pulling the eyelids up or distorting it so the upper eyelid comes down and the lower eyelid is pulled down so as, as long as you can manage to manipulate that action you probably be okay but um, if, if possible as a single operator I'm sure you would have a vet so at least um, try and ask your vet to run you through just checking the colours. Sure, no worries. The other question that's come through is just in relation to whether or not the Barbavax vaccine is suitable for goats and um, if you don't mind Maxine I might just comment on that. Sorry you go. There, I've got a slide on that. Um, it's probably one of the latest slides, but um, it's slide 30. So if you want to get that up and you can talk to it at the same time. Okay, hang on one second. So it's, it's right near the end. It's the second last slide. Yeah. So the simple answer to the question is that yes, uh, the Barba vaccine will be suitable for goats. Currently at the moment, MLA along with the Goat Industry Council of Australia and the um, National Residue Survey are using goat levy producers funds to extend the sheep Barbavax registration to incorporate goats. So that's likely to be completed in March 2016 and we're hopeful that we'll have uh, the product registered for the summer of 16-17 uh, for people to be able to purchase and use. Uh, and in terms of the usage recommendations, it would be similar to what um, how people are using the um, the vaccine for sheep. So that would be, I guess, the the answer to to that question that's come through. Uh, the other question, Maxine, was um, so you mentioned there was a bit of a delay in the red blood cells reproducing and coming back once you've treated the animal for yep. the virus or for the anemia. Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned that you'd be checking weekly when there's um, peak periods there. So obviously record keeping is is certainly very important to make sure you've, you've identified those animals you've treated and you're taking yeah. into account that delay in the red blood cell production. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Excellent. Wow. Well, we haven't had any other questions come through at the moment. So, look, if if anyone who's listening in does have any questions that they'd like to uh, ask Maxine and myself, please feel free to include those in the questions panel um, there for us. 
Uh, we've had another question come through just asking if infestations occur all over Australia or if there's particular areas where there is much higher pressure for barber's pollworm vaccine. Well, I guess barber Barber's pole is certainly considered to be um, summer dominant, summer rainfall parasite, um, and it's got specific temperature and moisture requirements. So anywhere where, where it's hot and warm, certainly it's Queensland um, and northern New South Wales, and it, there are outbreaks, sporadic outbreaks, um, throughout the rest of Australia when conditions just happen to be quite warm in summertime, and there are um, there's lots of moisture around. So I've, I make some comment about that in the next few slides, but yeah, there are sporadic outbreaks, but Barber's Pole certainly is endemic in Queensland um, and on New South Wales. It's quite, quite an issue even on the New England tablelands in New South Wales. Okay, no worries. Well, we've had no other questions coming through just at the moment, so um, Maxine, if you're happy to keep going with your presentation, sure. we'll, we'll kick on. Okay, so the next slide, thanks. No worries. Okay, so I thought I'd just broaden the scope of this talk to cover some um, aspects of other on-farm tests. Next slide, thanks. So these are the main on-farm tests that goat producers are currently using to diagnose barbers pole infections. They are all ind indirect tests measuring an external sign to make deductions about the size or nature of the hidden infestation. So starting with the worm egg count, this procedure counts the number of worm eggs in a small amount of dung and research over the years has confirmed a correlation between the egg count and the adult worm burden in sheep and goats. The major limitation of the test is that it does not detect the size of the immature burden which can be quite large and dangerous in peak worm seasons. Dipstick detects the effects of both the adult and the immature burden on the host not the numbers of the worms present. Again, the test procedure requires a, de of a degree of patience and diligence and relies on a colour change to indicate the degree of worminess. Pharmachar, like dipstick, picks up the effect of the total worm burden on the host. The advantage of this procedure is that it only takes a few minutes to have an answer. As with all of these tests, the value of the results is dependent on adequate numbers of samples being collected. And as with all of these tests, the rechecking interval is short, preferably every week in peak worm season, as barber's pole infestations are very dynamic. Next slide, thanks. One limitation of pharmachar is that it cannot tell you anything about drench efficacy. Next slide, thanks. Drench checking is about the effect of the drenches on worms as opposed to pharmachar where you are looking at the effects of the worms on the host. So if you do your own egg counts, you have the opportunity to find at least 10 goats with moderate worm egg counts, say 500 to 1,000 eggs per gram. And remember the 2080 rule. You don't want goats with zero egg counts in this test. Just keep testing samples until at least, preferably 20, moderate egg count animals have been identified. Record the e-tag numbers so that you can resample these same goats in 10 to 14 days after the test drench. Next slide, thanks. So this table shows worm egg counts in a completed drench check. In the pre-drench data on the left, all accounts are in the middle range. Post drench data is on the right. A zero worm account is desirable. In other words, the drench was effective. But typically, at least one count is always high. The animal was either misdrenched or did not swallow the drench and therefore can be excluded from the calculations. So this is just another reason not to bulk dung samples prior to egg counting, but to process each sample individually. And it does take longer, but the results are more accurate. At this stage, the distinction needs to be made between this type of drench test and the drench resistance test. 
the drench resistance test is a much, much more sophisticated on-farm trial using multiple drench actives and an undrenched control group of goats. Laboratory analysis uses not only worm egg counts but also larval identification. Next slide, thanks. The inconvenient truth, as suggested by Dr. Ray Kaplan, is that in any population of worms, there are some that are innately programmed to be able to detoxify every new drench active that comes onto the market. And this genetic characteristic can be passed on to its offspring. So when we drench, we're intent on killing worms. But in reality, a drench is a way of selecting out, or leaving behind in this case, the resistant worms and removing only the susceptible ones. The resistant worms left in the goat that pass resistant eggs out on the pasture and begin the next generation. So the battleground then becomes the pasture. If the season is dry, there will be few susceptible larvae on pasture and the resistant worm population will remain dominant. During wet weather, the reverse is true. There will be lots of susceptible larval worms on pasture to dominate the recently arrived resistant ones and the road to drench failure will be slightly longer. So in other words, drenching in wet seasons is not as dangerous or as selective as drenching in dry seasons. Because worms are over dispersed in a herd, a relatively small number of animals are infected with most of the worms and it tends to be the same animals that are consistently infected with the high worm burdens over time. Pharmachar provides the opportunity to identify these animals, to remove them and therefore reduce the amount of drenching needed. This is a move away from the so-called global worming when all animals in the herd were drenched regardless. Next slide, thanks Julie. In any worm control program, it is necessary to have some appreciation of the seasonal incidence of worms in relation to the weather. Next slide, thanks. And this slide somewhat answers the question before. Worms do indeed work by the weather. These graphs were recorded in southern Queensland, but there are similar ones for each region in Australia. And these are basically to illustrate that worms don't actually disappear. Their numbers just wax and wane with their preferred levels of moisture and temperature. In tropical Queensland, for instance, temperatures are favourable for parasite development, for barber's pole development all year round. Moisture for this parasite becomes a limiting factor because North Queensland has two seasons, the wet season and the dry season. Temperature, not moisture, becomes limiting for Barber's Pole in temperate regions of Australia. So basically, worms flourish when conditions are suitable and reduce to survival levels when conditions are less favourable. I've just included nodule worm here that's uh, typically Queensland, and you can see, it, uh, see the nodules on the outside of the bow wall, and it can be felt as small calcified nodules on the inside of the bow wall when dung pellets are being collected. Note the five recommended drenches per year. These are the arrows at the top of the graph. We no longer recommend global drenching, but instead we recommend targeted selective drenching of just the wormy group. Next slide, thanks. So this is a five-point check system that has been developed by the same researchers in South Africa. And its overall benefit is that you have specific assessments to make every time you examine your goats and this will give more information on a greater spread of gastrointestinal parasites and remember record all this information. So there are five checkpoints on the animal's body. Check the eye for anemia using pharmachar, the jaw for fluid retention, the back for body condition scoring. Is the goat too thin? Is it too fat or is it just right? Is it losing weight or gaining weight? And body condition scoring is again on a score of one to five. Check the scale for fecal consistency and diarrhea. 
pellets are usually small, very dry and very hard when a barber's pole infestation is present and they're often soft to quite watery in severe scaleworm infestations. But then you have to decide is the loose fecal consistency due to lush feed or coccidiosis. And for goats, the nose check in sheep has been replaced by goat check. Is the goat rough or normal? So record all your assessments again against the tag number and record them over time to pick up the trends. Next slide, thanks. So the benefits of PharmaChar. While it's not a cure-all, it's just a tool that with correct use and good record keeping can alert you when a dangerous parasite infection is developing. And it will also tell you which animals should be treated and which animals do not need to be treated. And above all, PharmaChar is about drenches. It gives us the ability to reduce the number of treatments given. And it also gives us the ability to mix and match treatments so different animals will be treated at different times of the year. Okay, the next slide is about the vaccine and just the comment there that um, when the first and second vac uh, vaccinations are given, they're just priming the immune system. So for you as goat owners, it will be particularly important to use PharmaChar and the five point check frequently during this build up period and then you can just go into routine once you're starting to use the other vaccinations. And the last slide is just to show you about the Kapara website. So this is some work being done on the EU and their beef is very similar to yours. Goats aren't sheep and drug levels in goats really aren't uh, appropriate for levels in goats. So that, that's one website that you might be interested in and just having a quick look at. But there's a lot of research going on in the EU and in Mexico looking at this pharma child system in relation to uh, body condition scoring and faecal egg counting. Thanks, Julie. Thank you very much for that overview, Maxine. That was absolutely excellent and a great, um, a great source of information there for producers. So uh, again, if anyone has any questions at all that they would like to ask of Maxine and myself, please send those through through the questions panel on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, we've had a question come through just wondering how long you might need to sell pasture for to remove the barber's pole burden. Um, well again, it's all about um, dryness on pastures I guess, I, I'm not quite sure what what area um, we're talking about, but it's, it's temperature and moisture. Um, barber's pole eggs can hatch fairly quickly. They can hatch overnight and, and um, if there's a lot of moisture there, the survival rate of the larvae is very high. Um, and there are these fast rotation techniques where you just graze animals for um, a couple of days and move on to a number of paddocks. So you could have a series of seven or so paddocks and use a fast rotation there. Um, most importantly for goats, browse is, is in the mix. Goats have evolved um, in a browsing situation so they don't have a long history of being in contact with parasites that they pick up on the ground. So we think that their immune system is primed to do a bit of bra uh, gra uh, browsing which means that they're taking themselves away from the source of infection. So. Um, you need to know your temperature and moisture conditions and there should be some information on I think the MLA website about rotational uh, grazing and fast grazing. Um, but again you need to look at the height of the grass, temperature and moisture, the number of goats you have, maybe perhaps separating age groups out because some age groups are more susceptible than others and some class of goats are more susceptible than others to worms. Thanks Maxine. The, uh, the person in question has just come back to clarify that they are located in the central tablelands of New South Wales around Bathurst. So um, oh, okay. just in case that sort of changes any of your um, response or answer there. Well, um, they probably have drier periods so that should help them with the rotation. Um, but you would think in those areas that Barber's Pole well, I guess Barber's Pole is November to March, so in, the, in those particular times uh, it's, it's when rainfall occurs and the level of rainfall and 
and the evaporation rate after rain has fallen, so if it's a really high evaporation rate, survival times of the parasite on the pasture will be lower. Um, but maybe it's just that six month period when the rain comes between somewhere between December and February, depending when it falls. But uh, yeah, anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. There, are, there are certainly programs of fast rotational grazing and that's one way of doing it. But certainly selecting uh, out a, a more resistant group of goats is, is pretty important as well. Because as I said before, Barber's pole is different from the other ones. It's a huge egg layer. So even if you've got your pastures in, under control and everything is under control, you just need some wet weather and these big egg outputs, lots of survival on pasture and everything is just um, not good. Yep, thank you. Are you aware of any um, systems being run where alerts are sent out to producers by region when they're at risk of a more of an outbreak? Um, look, I'm not, but I, w I would imagine if you hooked into some of the leading sheep um, areas, they would be doing barber's pole alerts for their sheep producers uh, and it would be the same. I I guess you don't have sheep in northern Queensland. Um, so so I, I, I know leading sheep have in the past sent it out. Um, what about wormboss.com.au? So that is mainly for sheep. They're looking at doing some work for goats perhaps. Um, and they would certainly have some alerts there. So um, Wormboss has these monthly newsletters uh, and it's all about um, the worm situation in those regions. So that might be something for you to have a look at. That might give you some clue as to what's happening. Yeah. Is there anything that you're aware of that could be applied to a pasture area uh, to control worms such as lime for example? Yeah, it's interesting isn't it? Um, people have been looking, looking at this for years um, and there are a lot of alternative remedies um, and some of them do have some effect but they're not the total answer. So it would just be another thing that you would do. Um, and I guess a lot of people say that they're liming their pastures anyway. Um, and I think it's just perhaps you feel that the larval burden has gone. It's just maybe pastures are longer, longer, are longer, longer, <laughs> long, uh, and goats are grazing a little bit higher off the ground. And, and um, if the pastures are lush, the larvae won't be forced to move up to the top of the grass blades. Yeah. Okay. Um, what would be some other causes of anemia and bottle jaw, for example? Uh, in, the, in the parasite line, um, you might be looking at long-term liver fluke problems. Um, anything that causes anemia, certainly nutrition. There's um, copper and cobalt issues. Uh, certainly in some areas um, of Queensland they put copper in with some of their drenches, cobalt. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's a number of things and a number of things your, your vet will be able to tell you about. Okay. Um, just had a question come through from an audience member wondering if you might be able to run through the procedure on slide six, oh, uh, sorry, slide seven. Uh, which I've just put up on the screen, just um, checking the eye and so forth. Oh, okay, okay. So, so basically, you've got your goat in good natural light um, in a race somewhere where it's restrained and easy for you to have a good look at. So you use the thumbs of both hands, and with the thumb of the upper hand, you gently push down vertically over the eyelid. So you're basically closing the eyelid and the thumb of the lower hand is pulling that lower eyelid downwards. So you're, you're closing up the eyelid and you're exposing that mucous membrane there. And if you go to the next slide, Julie. Okay, and, and that's what you're reading there. So that little mantra says when you, um, when you cover both those eyes and you're pushing down on the top eyelid and pulling down on the lower eyelid, those mucous membranes will pop into view. So that's I think is the next slide. Maybe people want to have a look at that again. Yep. 
Oh, okay, next one. Yeah, so it's cover, push, pull, pop. And that, that um, website, that, even if you put that in it's, it's your search engine, that will, that will come up. The reference to that will come up and you'll be able to download that and see for yourself. Are you meaning the, the uh, web address at the bottom of the page? Yeah, so that's, that's too long to actually remember. But if you just go to your search engine and put in cover, push, pull, pop or something like that and pharmachar, that mm -hmm. reference to that will come up. So it's the little flyer that has been produced in the United States. So that, that will okay. enable you to download that. It's in colour and you'll be able to read it at your leisure and keep it with you. Okay. So in summary, if people uh, are wanting more information following on from the webinar today, obviously as you just said, they can Google the, the cover pool sorry, the cover, push, pull, pop, farm char in their web browser. Uh, yep. There's information on the Worm Boss website as well that they might be able uh, to access. Yes, and, and yep. certainly, certainly the American Consortium for Small Ruminant Parasite Control. That, that would be the first port of call. Um, yep. And Ray Kaplan's open letter, we might, um, you might be able to send the link to that around um, in an email because I think that's fairly important yes. that participants actually read that. It's just one and a half A4 pages so it's reasonably short but it covers all the points. Excellent, okay. Well, um, I think we have just about exhausted the questions mm -hmm. coming through from the audience members. Uh, what we'll be able to do following on from this webinar is that as I mentioned before, this is all being recorded. So the recording will be uploaded to the Meat and Livestock Australia website. So if you do know of anyone who wanted to join in with us today and, and listen to the webinar but wasn't able to, I will be emailing around to everyone who registered today a, a link to where the webinar is saved as well as links to some of the other information that Maxine has spoken about today. So you'll have ready access to that in the email that will come through in the next 48 hours. We do also have uh, some other information, um, so if you're looking at um, information about different chemicals and so forth that um, are currently registered for GOAT, uh, you're certainly able to pop along to the APVMA website. So I've listed the, the website address there and um, the options in terms of going through the website and finding uh, um, information about uh, chemicals registered for goats and this information will be circulated to, to everyone who's registered um, to attend today's webinar as well. And I know this is a very busy slide so I apologise in advance but there are a number of other events coming up, um, virtually all of which are free, which people can register for. So. Our next webinar that we'll be running is on the 21st of July and it's all around farm biosecurity. So talking to people about um, the risks of, of not having a, a good um, farm biosecurity plan in place uh, and what you can do, where you can go to for help, um, the types of things you can do to minimise the risk to your business. So that's free to register for and again I will circulate the link for that to everyone who's attended. The leading sheep um, group based in Queensland are very active as well and as you can see there all the different webinars and content there that's listed in blue, those are webinars and events that they are running. Again those are free and again those are being recorded and will be uploaded to their website uh, after the event. So you can find all of those uh, by following the Leading Sheep link um, that I've provided there on the page or simply Googling Leading Sheep Queensland. So obviously they've got a whole range of webinars that they are running but they also do have some field days and um, workshops around predator control and fencing but obviously those are in physical locations so it's a bit more difficult for people to get along to if you're, if you're not based locally. But I'd encourage everyone to subscribe to the e-newsletters and so forth that, um, that leading sheep circulate because then you'll get 
direct notifications about some of these events that are coming up which may be relevant to your business. Uh, Best Prac, which is another sheep program, also has a webinar coming up on the 26th of June which is all around telemetry. So uh, if anyone is on a, a particularly a larger property uh, and they're spending a lot of time racing around checking water points and opening and closing gates and so forth to move stock around, this uh, webinar might be of interest to those people because it provides, uh, it goes through an actual case study of some producers who are using technology to basically save themselves a whole bunch of time and money um, remotely monitoring and controlling those different, um, those different um, parts of their business. If you did want more information about any other MLA events, um, all of those are listed on the Meat and Livestock Australia website. And as I mentioned, all of our webinars are recorded. So if at any point in time you've missed one, uh, this is actually the sixth webinar that we've held in the last 12 months. All of those are recorded and you're welcome to go to the MLA website uh, and watch those at your leisure. But um, I'll just check if we've got any final questions, Maxine. Um, but otherwise, uh, I'd like to say thank you very much to you for your time today in, in answering our questions and providing that valuable presentation. Uh, we just had one final question coming through just in relation to is water belly caused by Barber's pole worm? Is water belly? Yes. I don't think I know. No what... further information in, in the question, I'm sorry. Well, well I, guess, I guess um in a goat that's uh, really anemic, um, you do get that edema, and it does, and the, the tissues are heavy, so they they do fall under gravity. It's certainly um, down the front and sort of up between the legs. But I think this sounds like something else to me. So I think that's a question for the vet. Yep, excellent. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for the webinar today, and thank you very much, Maxine, for your time today in providing such a, a valuable overview and presentation for everyone. Um, what we might do is, is wrap up the presentation today and as I said, um, the links to further information etc. will be forwarded around to all the attendees in the next 48 hours. So thank you very much again everyone for your time and thanks so much Maxine. Thank you. Goodbye.